So we're going to talk a little bit today about exception handling. Uh, I'm going to ask you to start a brand new project. I'm going to call mine exception handling project. And I'm going to create a fake class called demo, which is just going to be used to demonstrate some aspects of exception handling. Let's talk a little bit about why I waited until after the AP exam to teach you exception handling, what's so important about it, et cetera. So my first job out of college, I worked for the phone company. Back then, believe it or not, there was only one phone company. It was called AT&T. And I was hired as a programmer, and we were building equipment that basically provided phone service to people that lived in rural areas really far away from the central office, in other words, the telephone company offices. When you live really far away from a central office, providing phone service is especially difficult. If they run wires all the way out to a farm, the, the phone has trouble generating enough current to drive all the way back to the cell uh, to the phone office. So we used to build a little box that you would bury underground for about 25 years. And that would sit near the farm, and then you would have wires that would run from that box over to the farmer's house where the phones would be located. So you can imagine that in that environment, if you were to have some bugs in your code, trying to dispatch a technician to visit three, four, five thousand of these scattered throughout the countryside would be prohibitively expensive. And so uh, the managers who managed those software projects were extremely conservative about what code we were allowed to put into that box and what code we were not. So for example, recursion, no. No recursion was allowed inside our code because it was just considered too dangerous. If there was a bug that would show up, the chances for a dispatch would be very high. So they had to keep the code very simple. We also had rules where every loop had one entrance and one exit. So no break, no continue, none of that business was allowed. You would be surprised to learn that if you were to look at all the code that sat in this box, more than half of it was used to handle errors. That's typical for a piece of software that runs in a system where half the code or more ends up being used to handle errors. Given that that's the case, you might be surprised that I have not taught you how to handle errors in this class so far, given how incredibly important it is in the life of a programmer to be able to handle errors. And the reason that I haven't taught it to you is because it is not on your AP exam. The reason it's not on your AP exam is that every language handles errors differently. Java is no different. It handles errors using something called exception handling that we're going to talk about today and also next class. And since this test that you just took yesterday, the AP exam is supposed to be a computer science exam and not a Java exam, for that reason, exception handling is not featured on the test. However, you don't want to leave my course and call yourself a Java programmer if you can't handle errors, because if you get a summer job as a programmer, Handling errors is going to be pretty much half of everything that you do in your code. So being able to handle errors is important. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, but I get errors all the time, and the operating system handles it just fine. Well, it handles it just fine for you because you're a programmer. But imagine that you've written an application that's sitting on the desktop of a secretary, and the secretary runs the code, and all of a sudden, all this red ink starts showing up saying divide by zero or null pointer exception. Does any of that mean anything to a secretary? Does, can a secretary look at saying null pointer exception and say, oh, I see what went wrong here? You can see that those types of error messages are not appropriate for people that are using your application. They're appropriate for you because you're the programmer. You know what the errors mean. So what you need to do is instead of letting the operating system handle the errors, you need to anticipate as many of the errors as you can, and you need to react to it so that you can present your users, whether they're a scientist, a mathematician, a secretary, whoever it is, you need to give them much more 
definitive, descriptive error messages explaining what they did wrong. And that's what we're going to learn how to do today after lunch and also next class. So we have about five minutes left now. I'm going to give you another break right now. When you get back from lunch, we're going to learn how to handle the most basic of errors. One of the places in your code where errors crop up the most is when you're reading and writing files. When you're reading and writing files, a lot can happen. The file might not be there. The person might have spelled the name wrong. They may have, they may have deleted the file while the program was running. Users do a lot of crazy things. And so as a programmer, we need to anticipate some of this and have our code be flexible enough to deal with some of these issues. And I'm going to show you how to do some of that after lunch.